and welcome, I'm your code monkey, and I've just published another update to my DOTS course, this is one of the most important ones, this time it's adding 15 new lectures covering all about making a DOTS grid system and flow field pathfinding. This was a really tricky subject to make into understandable step-by-step -step lectures, but I managed to make it. The lectures start off very slowly introducing all the concepts and all the limitations of a data-oriented design, and then bit by bit we're going to implement the whole grid system and the pathfinding algorithm. The pathfinding itself is the flow field algorithm as opposed to A star, which is an interesting thing. It has some pros and cons, with the main benefit being how flow field works really great when you have tons of units, just like in this game. We're going to build the pathfinding and make all the units follow it, then of course make it all super performant with a bunch of optimizations and heavy use of the job system and... In the end, the pathfinding runs in just 0.27 milliseconds. That is super impressive. That speed, especially considering how there's still room for some improvements, making it that fast really showcases the awesome power of dots, so this is really super impressive. And of course, remember how you don't have to make games 100% with dots or 100% with game objects. You can mix them both. So you can, for example, follow these lectures, learn how to implement flow field pathfinding in a super fast manner, and then implement this pathfinding system in your own game object-based games. So you can make like an action game 90% using game objects, and then just use a handful of entities and this flow field pathfinding to make it super fast. And with this update, the course is now packed with tons of knowledge. It's got almost 15 hours split across 75 lectures, all of them starting from the absolute basis of dots and going up to this really complex topic. You can go check out the new lectures right now with a link in the description. Here's a quick sample. Here's the three overview lectures covering a high-level overview of everything we're going to implement. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to see an overview of the grid system that we're going to implement and how we're going to build it in a data-oriented manner. Okay, so let's see the grid system that we're going to build. Now, if you're a regular with my videos, then you've certainly already seen me use a grid system plenty of times. It's a super useful data structure with so many use cases in game dev. It is really just a way of splitting the entire world into various grid positions and then be able to store some data on each of those grid positions. However, normally I use C-sharp objects to build my grid, whereas here on this Nots course, naturally we want to learn how to make it work in a data-oriented manner. This requires us to be a bit clever with how we set things up, but it's actually not quite that difficult. So first we're going to create the grid system, meaning an actual I system. Then we're going to use over here the onCreate in order to create the grid. Then we're going to use onDestroy for all kinds of cleanup. And on the onUpdate, this is where we're going to run all kinds of pathfinding logic. For storing the data for the grid, for that we're going to use mainly three data structures. We're going to first define a grid system data. This one contains the general data for our grid. So we're going to have the width, the height, the size of each grid object. So all the info that defines what is the actual shape and size of the grid. Which by the way, on this actually just one quick note. Over here we're going to be calling it width and height. And for the grid positions, we're going to use the X and the Y axes. However, in our game, the grid is flat. So when applied to the world, this grid will actually be the XZ axis. But due to how the mathematics library already works, due to how it already has things like the N2, which contains an X and a Y, because now we're going to name our grid logic with XY. Now technically we could define our own custom type and do all the logic with XZ, but I think it's really pretty simple, just keep in mind that the Y on the grid position, that one represents the Z in the actual world. Okay, so we have our width and height. This is going to be our grid system data, which is a normal I component. Then for storing that component, we're actually going to use something really nice that ECS has. It's how every single system already has a backing entity by default. So for storing that component, we're just going to store it on the system's entity itself. Then inside the grid system data, we're going to store a grid map. This one is just a normal struct, it is not a component. And inside the grid map, we're going to store a native array of all the entities. These are going to be all the entities that do make up our grid. So on each grid position, on each grid node, we're going to create a brand new entity. And on each of those, we're going to attach this grid node component. This component is basically what stores what data we have on each grid position. So for the basics, we're going to store the X and Y position and then some kind of data. Later on, we're going to expand upon this in order to add data related to the pathfinding algorithm. So this is the main structure of our grid system. We have the main grid system data. Then inside it, we have a grid map. And inside that grid map, we have an array of all the entities. And all those entities that make up all those grid nodes, all of those have this grid node component. And put it all together, we have all the data for our entire grid. So that allows us to define both the entire shape of the actual grid and define any kind of data to place in each grid position. Also, by the way, in case you're wondering, why do we have a grid map field over here? Why not just directly store this native array directly over there? The reason for that is because later on when we implement pathfinding, we're actually going to need multiple grid maps. It won't work if we have just one. So later on, we're actually going to refactor this to be a native array of grid maps. But if we did not need that, then sure, we could just store this one directly over there. 
All right, so this is the design that we want to implement. So let's start doing that in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to see an overview of the flow field pathfinding algorithm that we're going to implement. Okay, so pathfinding. Now this is a topic that basically every game requires. And it's also one where we have lots of possible options. Now for games of this type, for RTS games, some of these games use A star pathfinding. Games like Age of Empires, those usually calculate a path from A into B. And then other games, like for example Supreme Commander, those use flow field pathfinding. In this one, you basically have a field, and in each grid position, it calculates a vector, and if you follow those vectors, eventually it reach the target position. Both of these are perfectly valid options. So essentially, A star gives you a direct path from A to B, whereas in flow field, that one calculates the entire map in order to reach a final destination. Now, both these types can be perfectly valid options. A star is especially great when you have multiple different starts and endpoints, and flow field, this one is really great when you have tons of units and all of them going to the exact same destination. For example, if you have a thousand units, then over here with A star, you're going to need to calculate all the paths from all the start positions to all the endpoints. So with a thousand units, you have to calculate a thousand paths. Whereas over here with flow field, for this one, you just calculate the path once to the destination. And then any amount of units, as long as they're going to that same destination, any amount of units can just follow the path. They just look at whatever grid position they are on and they just follow the vectors underneath. And if they follow, they eventually reach the final destination. Like I said, both can be valid options, and there are specifically lots of awesome RTS games made with either method. Technically, flow field pathfinding is going to be faster the more units we have, since we just have to calculate the path once. So since this course is all about dots, which is all about tons of units, here let's implement flow field pathfinding. Now let's cover how the algorithm works. First of all, we have our grid, so the world is split into grid positions, and like we already did. Then for the grid data, on each of those grid nodes, we're going to need to have three things. We need to have a cost, a best cost, and a vector. Now the cost over here, this one is how expensive it is to traverse through that one grid node. With this cost is how we can have variable costs on, for example, different types of terrain. Like going through water, it takes a bit more energy than going through flat terrain. This cost is also how we're going to define walls. We're just going to give them a very high cost. So in general, we're going to define the cost for the destination node as zero. Then all normal walkable nodes are going to have a cost of one. And our wall nodes, those are going to have the max cost. In this case, we're going to use a byte to store the cost. So the max cost will be 255. And the reason why to use byte here is really just for memory efficiency. But technically, of course, we could use an int float or whatever else. So that's the cost. And then we have the best cost. This one represents what is the best cost going to a neighbor node from this node. So essentially, let's say we are on this node and we're trying to move on to this node. So we're going to set the best cost on this one. It is going to be the best cost from this one plus the cost of making this move. This is how we're going to figure out if going from this node to this node is the fastest path or not. We calculate the new best cost and the one with the lowest cost wins. And finally, we have the vector. So this one really just stores a 2D vector that points to the next node. All we need to do is follow the vector underneath that node and eventually we do reach the target position. So this is data that the algorithm needs on each grid node, the cost, the best cost, and the vector. Then the logic for the algorithm itself. The first thing we're going to do is set up the grid. So we're going to cycle through all the grid positions and set them up. Like I said, we're going to set the destination cost to zero, default to one, and walls at 255. That prepares the grid. Then we're also going to set up the best cost. We're going to default it to the max value. Like I said, later on the algorithm choose the lowest one. So this one basically defaults it to the highest possible possible. Then the algorithm has an open list. So the open list, this one contains all the nodes that are currently queued up for searching. The way the algorithm works is basically we're going to do a loop and we're going to run this loop on this logic for as long as we have nodes on the open list. So to kick off the algorithm, we're going to add the target node to the open list. That is going to be the star. Then we do our while. And on this while, we grab the first one on the open list. Then we grab all the neighbors of this node. Now the neighbors are all the nodes around it, meaning the nodes that can directly reach this node. And this is also where you can make one choice when it comes to pathfinding. For example, do you want just four-way movement or do you want eight-way? Both can work. Meaning, do you want units to just be able to move straight between positions or do you want them to also be able to use diagonals? Both are perfectly valid options. In this case, we are going to add diagonals. So over here, the neighbor nodes for this one are going to be all these eight nodes. Yep, all of these. So over here, back in the algorithm, so we cycle through all the neighbors. And then for each of those neighbors, we're going to calculate a new best cost, which again is the best cost of the origin node plus the cost of moving to that node. So for example, if we're testing this node and we're getting all the neighbors, let's say we are cycling through this neighbor over here. So the new best cost calculated for this node that one is going to be the best cost that we already have inside of this node, plus the cost of moving to this node, so the cost inside this node. And again, remember how the best cost is going to default to max value. 
So as we calculate the new best cost, if it's the first time we're going through that node on the open list, and that one is always going to be true, so we're always going to update it. And as well, if the new best cost is lower, if so, then we're going to update that data. And also, we're going to save that vector. So for example, here, if we know that this node and this node, this is the best cost, then we're going to basically store a vector over here that is going to point in this direction. Okay, and then simply we add the neighbor to the open list in order to be queued up for searching. So if we do this for all the neighbors, and basically just keep running all this logic while we have nodes on the open list. As soon as the open list is done, as soon as it's empty, that means we have checked all the nodes in the map, the algorithm has concluded, and each grid node will have the correct vector that eventually points to the target destination. Now, if you're feeling a bit confused, then don't worry. Once we implement this in the code, it will make quite a bit more sense. And if after going through the code, you still feel confused, if so, then come back here to this lecture again to see this overview. If this is your first time doing any kind of pathfinding, then it does indeed seem quite confusing at first. But once it clicks, it actually becomes pretty understandable. It is really just a set of rules that we follow, and in doing so, we end up with a complete calculated map. All right, so this is what we're going to implement. So let's start writing code in the next lecture. Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. In this lecture, we're going to see an overview of how we're going to structure the logic for our units to be able to follow the flow field path. Okay, so we have our flow field pathfinding algorithm fully working. We can get a destination and it calculates all the vectors for all the grid positions. And if we follow those vectors, eventually we reach the target. So now let's see how we're going to organize our components and systems in order to make this work for our units. Now, first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a flow field follower component. This one is an I component and it's going to store just a simple target position. This is a world position. This is basically where the unit wants to go in world space. And also this component is going to be enabled. When this one is enabled, then the unit mover system will follow the vector of the underlying grid node. For example, if the unit is here and wants to get here, then it's going to listen to this grid vector, going to move in this direction, then this direction, then this direction and reaches the target. So whilst that one is enabled, it is going to follow the underlying vector until it reaches the target position. And for moving, we're going to use the exact same code, the unit mover component that already has the target position. We're simply going to run some logic before that code. That logic is basically going to set the unit mover target position to be the current position. So let's say the unit is here. So it sets the target position to be the current position plus this vector by a tiny bit. So plus this, so it basically tells it to move this. Then as it gets here, it's going to tell it to move over here. Then as it gets here, it's going to tell it to move over here. And when it finally reaches target, then we just disable the component. Then the other component we have is going to be the flow field path request. This one, pretty much the same thing. We have a target position, also a component, also enableable. When we give a unit a move order through the unit selection manager, instead of moving it directly, instead of that, we're going to enable this component and set this target position. Then where we have our pathfinding logic, we're only going to run this pathfinding logic only when that component is enabled, which is when some unit is requesting some path. So basically the pathfinding will not be running all the time, only when there's an actual request. It grabs the target position from that component, runs the algorithm, and finishes the flow field. And once the path has been calculated, when that happens, we're going to disable this request, and we're going to enable the flow field follower. So here's the general logic. When we tell a unit to go somewhere, we're going to enable this component. Then when that one is enabled, we have a query over here on our grid system. It looks for that component being enabled. When it is enabled, grabs the target position and calculates the path towards there. Then once the path has been calculated, it is going to disable it, so it doesn't continue calculating the same path. And at the same time, it is also going to enable the flow field follower, so the actual unit is going to follow the actual calculated path. And yep, that's really it. This is how we're going to structure this logic. Afterwards, we're still going to expand upon this to handle multiple flow fields and optimize some things, but this is the core idea. We have a request, calculate the path, and then set the unit to follow that path. All right, so let's go on to the next lecture and begin implementing this. All right, so yep, that's how we're going to implement the grid system in dots and the flow field pathfinding. If you're already on the course, then you already have access to the new lectures. If you don't yet have the course, then you can pick it up with the link description. And like I said previously, my plan in the future is to make a free sample of the course whenever I finish the whole thing. I plan to make the first few hours as a free YouTube video, and I intentionally designed the course to contain lots of dot stuff in those first few hours. But that free video will be coming out after I finish the course, which will still take quite a while. So if you want to start learning dots right now, then you can pick up this course and get started. And this part, the flow field pathfinding, this one is near the end of the course. This part is not going to be included in that free sample, so if this is the specific part you're looking for, then go ahead and check it out. Unity also recently had their Unite conference where they talked about the next generation version of Unity and how it will have entities integrated directly with game objects. So I really highly recommend you start learning about dots. It's an excellent, extremely powerful tool that can make some code run over 200 times faster. It is a really awesome tool that you should definitely learn about. And Unity themselves have said that the API should not change much between now and the future, so it's safe to start learning right now to be prepared to use this really awesome tool whenever you need it. 
All right, so I just published these lectures and now I'm off to work on the next update. There's still quite a few fun things that I want to implement, but like I mentioned, the course is already very substantial right now. I think it has a ton of knowledge and has an excellent smooth learning curve, even though DOTS looks quite complex at first. So if you're already on the course, check out the new lectures. And if you don't yet own it, then check it out with the link in the description. Remember how I'm always available in the course comments, so feel free to ask any questions. And make sure to join the private Discord and join me on the weekly private live streams. Alright, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.